Good evening, everyone, and a very welcome, warm welcome to all of you on this online line debate, Make the City, What Does a City for and by Women Look Like? Especially on uh, the International Men's Day. It's a, a date very well chosen by the organization. Uh, so this debate is organized by the Stats Forum, um, and I, in particular, like to thank the curator Jan de Noe for inviting me uh, tonight for chairing this uh, evening. And so Stats Forum is a center for dialogue about the city of uh, tomorrow based in Antwerp, Belgium. And uh, of course you can find much more information on Stats Forum on the internet, on the website. And I would like to thank to thank all of you uh, to for joining us here today uh, for this dialogue. And it's still a very strange feeling to address a somehow invisible audience. So I'm very happy that we have two speakers here. Um, and I hope all of you will be able to follow this um, debate and the presentations well tonight and of course if there are technical problems I think there is a chat where you can put all your comments and remarks and this is also the case for all your questions and if you do so then we can integrate them into the discussions and so before we start um, maybe I will quickly introduce myself um, my name is Luz Beekmans. I'm assistant professor in architecture and urbanism related to migration and diversity uh, at the Department of Architecture and Urban Planning at Ghent University and also a researcher uh, for the Flanders Research Foundation um, um, in, in the, the Flanders Research Foundation. And my research is actually concerned with the spatial dimensions of urban diversity and, and more in particular I primarily focus on migrants, homemaking, and housing. And apart from that, I'm also a mother of three kids and, of course, a partner uh, to my husband. Um, so today we will kick off. I'm hoping that I can go to the program. But today we will kick off with a keynote of uh, by the Canadian Leslie Kern. Uh, as you might know by now, she is the author of The Feminist City, Claiming Space in a Man-Made World, published this year. Um, and uh, we will then proceed with presentations by first Els de Vos, and uh, after that uh, Sabine Miedema, and also from Palestine, um, Alessandra Gola is joining us uh, as a respondent uh, tonight for the discussions. So together, and greatly inspired by Leslie Kern's work, we will be challenging today the man-made city and try to envision what a city for and by women could look like and how we should, how we should make it and perhaps also claim it. And just as a teaser, I will read this uh, short quote from Leslie Kern's work. And yeah, we are getting there. So that's also the cover of her book. We live in the city, I start a quote, we live in the city of men. Our public spaces are not designed for female bodies. There is little consideration for women as mothers, workers, or carers. The urban streets often are a place of threats rather than community. Gentrification has made the everyday lives of women even more difficult. What would a metropolis for working women look like? And so this is a very powerful and also dense quote. And of course, there is no one better um, um, than, than Leslie Kern self to eliminate on it. And so we are very, very welcome and ver uh, very hon honored to welcome here tonight um, Leslie, Leslie Kern. Maybe I can, uh, if I may say Leslie. Um, and, and let me first, before you start your um, keynote, let me first uh, shortly introduce you. So, Professor, and, and now we, we, see we actually see uh, uh, Alessandra Gola, of course, um, <laughs> but uh, Professor Leslie uh, Kern is, aside of being the author of, of the book, uh, The Feminist City, also Associate Professor uh, in the Department of Geography and Environment, and, and, and also uh, Director of the Women's and Gender Studies at um, Mount Allison University in Canada. And she has done a PhD in Gender, Feminist and Women's Studies, at New York University 
and, and we are very, very happy and honored to welcome her today. And I hope uh, everything uh, will work so that I can now pass the, the, the word to her. To her and, and you have the floor for your presentation, Leslie. And after that, we will go into dialogue. Thank you. Thank you so much for that kind introduction. Thank you to the host for inviting me to be a part of this event. And I'm really looking forward to hearing the other presentations and to the conversation that we're going to have. I should make one quick correction. I did not go to the illustrious institution of New York University, the slightly less illustrious institution of York University in Toronto, Canada. So just, just for the sake of accuracy. I'll just begin to share my presentation. And if there's any problem seeing that, someone could let me know in the chat. Uh, so I'm coming to you today from the small town of Sackville, New Brunswick, Canada, on the uh, unceded Indigenous territory of Mi'kmaq and Maliseet peoples, uh, with whom we are governed by ongoing treaties of peace and friendship here. As Luz mentioned, I'm the author of the recent book, Feminist City, Claiming Space in a Man-Made World. And my purpose in writing this book was to bring to a kind of wider audience than my usual academic audience, some ways of thinking about the city as not just a stage where social relations happen, but as a kind of active participant in shaping all sorts of things, power relations, gender roles, social inequalities, class differences, and to help everyday people look around their built environments and ask critical questions, you know, why was this built this way? Who, who built this? What power relations does it reflect? For whom does this space work well? And for whom is this space uh, exclusive or, or inaccessible? So those were just some of the questions that I wanted to open up with this book. And it's been quite interesting to now be having these conversations in the time of a pandemic. Of course, I wrote this uh, before the pandemic, but it seems that, that many of the issues that I raised have um, been of interest to people now in terms of thinking, you know, how do we live in cities? How do our public spaces function? How does our housing function? And what are some of the limitations of, of these spaces? So I'm always careful to say that the book is not a blueprint. I'm, I'm not an architect or a planner, but I think the book does share kind of a set of values, ways of thinking about what different perspectives we could begin to put at the forefront if we want to move towards something that might be called a feminist city. So my objective here in, in sharing with you today is to encourage us to consider what the city could be like if we had a different set of priorities put right in front instead of kind of marginalized or, or made an afterthought in the city. So as I mentioned, the COVID crisis has really laid bare a lot of longstanding problems and inequalities, but they have kind of bubbled to the surface now and are much more noticeable to people who, for whom problems with these aspects of the city were kind of invisible. One of them is the form and function of the home, the kind of family that many of our homes are designed for, the ways that our homes are kind of uh, limited in the multiple roles that we're now expecting them to play. And of course, questions about what the single family home keeps hidden. So care labor for one, domestic violence for another. Um, the, the single family home is this kind of very predominant form. And it's one of the key things that I think we need to question in a uh, feminist city vision. And of course, public space is another aspect of this as we're all trying to think of different ways to use our outdoor spaces the public spaces in our city we have to ask how have our public spaces been set up to include some people and exclude others and what new ways could we imagine our public spaces functioning to help provide some of the different sorts of care labor and collective services um, and even just socialization that are so lacking under, under COVID and arguably have been kind of diminishing over time long before this particular pandemic crisis hit us. So in thinking about the feminist city, there's a variety of questions that we can ask. These are just some of them. Um, the, the image that's here is kind of a, a you know, a pandemic only a public space image of a, of a park with circles drawn on it for different little bubbles of households and, and friends to gather in to, you know, enforce some model of, of social distancing in public space. But it's 
you know, I, I showed this picture as kind of an example of the kinds of interventions that we're doing, but also it's a fairly perhaps limited way of thinking about using public space as well. Uh, but what are some of these questions? So the first one might be, are our cities, homes and the buildings within them really built to carry us through crisis and not just this one, but climate crisis, financial crisis, care labor crisis, and so on. And we have to ask who and what have we been relying on to keeping, keep our cities functioning. And by this, I really mean, you know, whose labor, whose unpaid and underpaid labor has really been keeping this thing that we call the economy functioning. And so what assumptions underpin these systems of, of labor, right? Gendered assumptions, uh, racialized assumptions, um, assumptions about what kind of labor is valuable and skilled and important, um, assumptions about where this work should be done, home, public, something else. The next question would be, you know, what values inform our design? So all of us bring with us a set of social norms, uh, values, belief systems that shape everything from what kind of spaces we find beautiful and fun and interesting to our perspectives on what uh, inclusivity looks like in public space, what justice looks like in public space. So we have to kind of unearth some of those values, bring them to the surface so that we can see how they're informing our environments. And then of course we can ask, you know, how is design, how is the, the built form actually contributing to various problems and, and how could it contribute to some solutions? So in thinking about envisioning a, a more feminist city, so I say more because I don't assume that there's a perfect utopia out there that will one day reach, but that we can um, engage in a process together of, of improving things over time. So for envisioning kind of a more feminist city, uh, I like to think about several, um, you could call them building blocks, principles, values that we might <clears throat> start to bring closer to the, the center of the way that we think about the city again, rather than having them be um, afterthoughts. So the first one is the idea of bringing the margin to the center. And the images in this slide, we, we see a person using a wheelchair and accessing um, public transportation system. Um, a man pushing a stroller and, and walking with a young child and a group of elderly people walking down a public street using their mobility devices, their walkers as we, as we call them uh, over here in, in North America. And what I want to suggest here is that many of the groups in the city that I think planners, architects, politicians have seen as marginal groups, as minorities, as niche or special interest groups, that when we take all of these groups together, we're actually the majority. We are not special interest groups. We are not a niche market. We are not a um, small group of people that require some kind of enhanced interventions. That in fact, when we look at uh, who urban citizens are, it's an incredibly diverse group of people. And I would encourage those of us who, who have the opportunity to either speak to or to act as practitioners in the city to really um, think about what the city could be like if we kind of started from the needs of those who have been presumed to be the outliers and the marginal and brought those to the center because I'll just say it bluntly I mean those who have long been at the center uh, you know a white able-bodied middle-class man he'll be fine, right? The interventions that we make to improve the lives of women, disabled people, elderly people are not going to ruin his life in any way. So, but, but in fact, um, these, these interventions can really, I think, spread out to impact and improve the lives of many people. So a second principle would be thinking through um, the role of the symbolic, so representations in, in space and I'm definitely inspired by the resurgent Black Lives Matter movement that we saw picking up again over the summer as um, one, of the, one of the many things that they did was to remind us that representation in public space matters. It matters who your monuments are to, it matters what, who your spaces are named after, it matters what stories we're telling about our public spaces. So some of the images that I have here are um, people in Bristol tearing down the statue of Edward Colston, who was a slave owner and trader, a statue of uh, commemorating the use of um, comfort women as um, essentially victims of sexual assault for soldiers, 
And the final one is an image from my hometown, Toronto, where there's been a move to indigenize some of the street names to bring indigenous language back into the urban environment. So these are all examples of kind of symbolic interventions, but they're, they do matter because um, the symbolic does convey to people either you belong here, you matter, your history matters, your stories matter, uh, you're welcome here, or you're not. And I think it's clear that many of our public spaces um, and, and private spaces have been communicating to people that they don't matter, that they are lesser than, uh, that their histories are not as important. So I think the symbolic is one place that we can uh, make some key interventions. Thirdly, I want to think about uh, different ways of imagining the home and asking us to be, get creative about how we could kind of turn some of those hidden and invisible and often exploitative elements of care labor in the home and kind of explode them out into public space or at least trickle out into public space. So how can we think about urban spaces that are designed to share care work, to collectivize it in some way and to make it visible so that it's not this um, hidden away, uh, often stigmatized and undervalued form of work, but something that we both see happening in public and something that a wide group of people can both imagine themselves participating in and actively participate in. So we can imagine everything from community kitchens to outdoor cooking, meal preparation, and sharing of food, especially with vulnerable, elderly, poor members of the community. We can imagine ways of having children intervene in the built environment by having their classrooms in outdoor spaces or participating in some way in uh, the shaping of the built environment or even just simply being present. Um, so how can we take some of this, this care work, this, um, the social functions of society that are often hidden inside, kind of turn them inside out? The next one is, is quite obvious and I find myself saying very obvious things like people have bodies, but all too often the embodied nature of urban life is seen as kind of too messy, too inconvenient, something that planners and designers and architects aren't that excited to deal with. I don't think anybody goes to architecture school to think about building a fantastic bathroom or um, where to put a bench in a public park. These are maybe not the sexiest, most glamorous aspects of thinking about building cities, but they are the very building blocks of things that allow, I think, a democracy to flourish because they allow people to be in public. And again, the, the COVID crisis has shown that as we are being encouraged to use public spaces, outdoor spaces more, there's a real lack of facilities that provide for our basic human needs, our needs to use the restroom for ourselves and to care for others, to have a restroom that matches our gender identity, to have places to sit, places to get water, places to get food, shade, shelter, warmth. Um, most, uh, most places have not done a great job of providing for these things in our outdoor spaces. So if we started from the body, if we imagine what do humans as embodied organisms need, um, we, we could, I think, imagine a much more accessible and again, inclusive urban environment. And the last principle that I'll mention today, and this is of course not an exhaustive list, these are just a few that I, I thought I would highlight here, is the question of safety, which is, is something that people repeatedly uh, want to talk about. It, it certainly is a key issue in our cities, but again, kind of echoing what, what I've learned and tried to take on from listening to Black Lives Matter and to prison and, and police abolition movements is that we, we need to think about safety in a new way, not safety as a top-down form of securitization that comes from policing, military interventions, walls, CCTV, surveillance, and so on but the kind of safety that comes when everybody in your community has what they need to thrive. So when people have housing, education, healthcare, mental health care, um, access to good food, childcare, all of the things that create um, a, a firm foundation of safety for the most vulnerable people, I think safety kind of trickles up at that point, right? Such that the people who already have a fair amount of privilege who seem to be the ones talking about fear and safety all the time. Um, if, if, if everybody kind of has their basic needs met, I think then this kind of fear of violence from so-called others in society is, um, can decrease because we can start to um, see our similarities. We can start to work together to 
create the kinds of communities, neighborhoods, and cities that we want. So again, we need to kind of apply our imaginations, uh, look at the you know longstanding work of of prison and, and police abolitionists, and say. Uh, what kinds of models of, of community safety can we imagine going forward? So I'll just uh, wrap up my remarks here by reiterating that I do think that we can imagine cities that have a different set of values and priorities at their center. And a feminist vision is not the only way to do this, but I think um, centering things like care, embodiment, uh, valuing different forms of labor, um, valuing community safety. These are, these are key to just and sustainable visions of the city. And thinking from a kind of a, a justice and equity standpoint can be a nice starting points that can maybe reorient some of the, the ways in which we've gone about um, building cities, planning cities, knocking down cities, building new cities, and so on. So thank you so much for, for listening to that, uh, to my discussion today. Thank you so much, uh, Leslie, for your fascinating presentation. Thank you. Um, now we have a little bit more time to, to go a little bit more in depth on some of the things that you have uh, been saying. Um, and so I will, uh, I will pose you some questions and, 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 and give some comments and uh, also with inputs uh, of uh, Alessandra Gola, and, and let me uh, shortly introduce her. Alessandra Gola's research uh, considers the relationship between society, built environments, uh, and citizenship, um, with a particular focus on the experience of displacement uh, within context of conflict and social uh, unrest. And she is based in Palestine and has co-founded there the Yala Project. So she will be able to bring in a kind of other um, non-Western perspective, also perhaps um, uh, um, a less privileged perspective to the uh, discussion. Welcome, uh, Alessandra. Nice to see you. Thank you. Uh, nice to see you. So first, to sum up a little bit uh, up your presentation, Leslie, do I understand it right that the feminist city is not only about some kind of punctual interventions uh, to, in a way, correct the man-made city. I think it's it's much it's about the much more fundamental and structural work uh, that you are talking. I, I think it's probably not only about providing the infrastructure so that women can carry on their uh, care work, um, or, or, or or at least try to combine it uh, with with their professional life. I think it's also about questioning the current gendered. Uh, divisions of labor and the many ways these have been infrastructuralized in, in the urban fabric, I think, because, for instance, urban planners and architects are very often um, male or urban policies and urban regulations are, are, are reproducing to some extent stereotypes. Um, also because women often take up a lot of care work and don't always have the luxury or privilege to claim space, urban space. So I'm very curious why in particular you think that cities are our best hope, because that's also there you end your, your, your book with cities as, as possibilities. And, and could you give us a little bit, uh, maybe some examples or, or best practices where you have seen it happening, a s a kind of gender sensitive urban planning and, 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 and or urban infrastructure? Thank you for that question. And yes, you, you have it absolutely right when you say that I'm not just concerned with thinking about how to make cities uh, slightly easier for women to carry all of the burdens that they currently carry, but a, a more um, radical point of view that thinks about how cities could um, you know, reimagine the very ways that we, we we currently divide so much of this labor along lines of gender, but also along lines of, of race and class. And I like the way that you said, you know, how this has been infrastructuralized. I think that's a great way of putting it, you know, thinking about how these, you know, gender roles and norms, for example, have literally kind of gotten baked in to the built environment in terms of our homes, in terms of how cities are zoned, in terms of how our transportation networks are set up. So um, yes, thank you. That was a that was a perfect summary. And as to your question about um, 
you know, why are cities a, a sort of best hope? What, what can cities in particular offer? Um, you know, in, in many ways, cities have long been the, the sites of uh, progressive social movements and social change. They're not the only sites for that, but they do bring together that critical mass of people who um, over time can uh, both shift a discourse. So for example, seeing the discourse shift towards being even able to talk about something like defunding the police, that's not a conversation that you could have in the mainstream media a year ago. So to see that discourse shift, but then to also um, use spaces of protest and, and to use that kind of collective urban voice to um, illustrate a different kind of set of practices or, or way of being in the city. As to you know, what examples can we point to? Well, certainly there are many cities that have taken on a gender mainstreaming approach, which is where you kind of run all of your policy through a gender equity lens. I think in my book, I mentioned Vienna, which gets spoken about a lot as a city that tried to first listen to people, including women, uh, before they went about making an intervention. So that community participation aspect is really key. And, um, you know, did all sorts of interventions from the symbolic, for example, naming new streets and, and public spaces after women in, in um, an area that was being redeveloped. And then trying to make sure that everything was closely integrated in terms of the different needs that people have in their day-to-day -day life to take care of children, take them to school, do their shopping, go to a medical appointment, look after an elderly parent, go to their paid job, um, do community work, all of those different kinds of things. And I think we're seeing that reflected now as well in some of the visions around like a 15 minute city that the mayor of Paris has been talking about, again, not exclusively from a feminist perspective, but that is one thing that feminists have often pushed for in terms of infrastructure is to make sure that the 15 minute city includes the importance of, of care labor and has that kind of built into your, your 15 minute vision that it's not just, um, work, home, and a space of leisure, but that all of the, the care work is also kind of part of that, that 15 minute vision. So those are a couple of things that I can point to. I don't know that there is yet a kind of um, iconic feminist city out there, but I think in any city that we look to, we can find especially little activist and community organization pockets of work that are being done. You know, in the, in the pandemic, we've seen mutual aid, kind of crop up as a way of uh, which people, you know, not, not waiting for the state or even nonprofits to take care of them and their neighbors, but figuring out ways to do it themselves. And I think cities offer a great opportunity for ways that we can continue to kind of collectivize that community care. Okay, thank, thank you for, so much for that. And, and so I, I think I do understand it, it's right. If, if, if I say that the feminist city is, is more than just a plea to re rethink the man-made city. It's, I feel it's much more than that. It's actually perhaps also building on, the, uh, on for instance, the book of Nancy Fraser, Feminism for the 1990%. It's, it's a plea to challenge all kind of normative urbanisms, uh, probably. And, uh, and, and for instance, by, by bringing to account the women's uh, spatial and embodied experiences, but also and more generally various forms of essential care work. Uh, I think the COVID crisis has really, uh, has been a very good lens uh, to, to, to revalue re actually these essential jobs and uh, which to a large extent are uh, executed by non-white people um, and, and which are made invisible in how cities are set up to some extent. And, and, and so, I think that's why th 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 I think it's right that you in 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 a certain way mobilize the the feminist and intersectional lens to to dismantle what we take for granted in 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 the urban form and in 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 the city isn't it and I think that maybe you could expand a little bit on that and and I would after you uh, like to give the floor on uh, to to Alessandra too because I think that that she could also uh, uh, say a little bit uh, on that yes again I, I completely agree with you that a feminist city vision is not 
uh, just one where we, for example, replace the kind of normative male figure at the center of the city with a similar sort of female figure at the center of the city, that would produce some changes. But uh, as, you, as you mentioned, I'm trying to take a sort of intersectional approach, which doesn't see gender as the only access of power uh, of, of oppression in cities and understands the way that class, for example, as well as race, colonialism, um, age, sexuality are also key factors, both in how people experience the city and in how power operates in the city. So a feminist vision, um, as complicated and messy as all of that sounds, uh, is, is about a more, I think, radical revisioning of how we understand the economy, for one thing, right? How we understand the long-standing assumption that there's a division between care work and unpaid work and the formal economy instead of understanding how those um, are inextricably linked. Um, I think understanding ongoing you know, colonial dispossession of, of environments, urban and otherwise, is a, is a key part of thinking about a feminist city because I don't want to impose a kind of neo-colonial reclaiming of the city in the name of relatively privileged white women, for example, without taking into account people who have long been marginalized and continue to be so. So yeah, that intersectional approach, again, it's not easy. It's, it's complicated. It's messy. It doesn't line up neatly in a sort of planning grid, but I think it's it's an essential, at least set of questions that we have to ask as we envision something different for the future. So Alessandra, would you like to react on that? Um, well, first of all, I would like uh, to um, thank you very much for this uh, very insightful presentation and also for your very beautiful book. And uh, I would like just to start by saying that um, reading your work from this part of the world uh, is uh, really, um, it, it triggers uh, so many uh, questions and I think it's, um, to, look, to look at it from here uh, offers uh, quite particular angles. Um, so I would like to, to talk to, with you about like uh, just a couple of, um, let's say, Hot, hot points that um, I have found confronting with your book while working here. So, um, for example, I'm now talking from a context that is definitely a non-welfare state and where um, the social structure is completely different from the one we are used to either in Europe and uh, in uh, North America. So we shift the perspective from an individual-based society to an idea of collective uh, in, uh, individuality. Um, I make reference, for example, to uh, the work of, uh, um, uh, of Khalidi, uh, who explains that well. So um, on one hand, um, and also it's, of course, it's an occupied, militarily occupied country, so where the, the narrative and the structure of the city also undergoes a kind of a, a specific filtering that is also very much political. So we have, as you, as you already said, uh, the intersection of very, very different factors that shape the city. So uh, on one hand, um, um, uh, I would like to, um, to ask, um, shifting from a Western, let's say, individual perspective to um, uh, community uh, individualism uh, that is here in, let's say, the Middle East and Asia. Uh, I noticed that here, like we have inherited um, um, a structure of the city, which is very much present in, in the Kasbahs, so in, uh, in the old towns, that is very much collective based. This has proved very useful uh, for offering resilience in times of crisis and to foster also the cooperation uh, amongst women uh, during conflict and during crisis. How, but however, this kind of collective idea of living together has also um, very oppressive uh, aspects, uh, that is the social pressure. So I wonder uh, what would be your position about 
uh, how to reform and in which way the city can help reforming also the education within families and within communities to have a more cooperative and a more inclusive attitude beyond the, the spatial layout. Thank you. Thank you so much for that question. This raises such interesting um, points. And I, 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 you know, acknowledge the sort of inherent limitations of writing from always a kind of Western and North American point of view. I think one of the things that's intriguing to me in thinking about how different cities around the world are kind of both structured socially and physically is um, it can help us with with some questioning of certain binaries that we might take for granted in that they may play out differently in different places. So for example, the, the, the binary of public private, right? We kind of, um, you know, I kind of know what that looks like in, in my community, in my, in, in my city, in my country, but how is that shaped differently in different sorts of places and how does that influence things like how uh, gender plays out, how gender depression is structured, or how opportunities for gendered um, empowerment also can happen. So I think there's some interesting, uh, you know, probably other binaries as well, like what is the division between home and work? What is the division, um, or is there a division between, you know, care labor and paid labor? Um, how, you know, what is the division between family and community, you know, in, in North America and in European contexts, there's often kind of that a strict division, you know, your family is your family and community is something else, but that may not be the same in other parts of the world. In fact, I would assume that it's, it's not. So I think looking at those differences can be really valuable for both showing us different ways of doing things, but also showing us different ways that, that power functions. Um, and I've just uh, realized that I might have forgotten the second part of your your question as I was sort of yeah, can, can tie, tie in here. Um, I think that this uh, remark of Alessandra also to some extent relates uh, with your, uh, Leslie, your, your very intriguing argument on gentrification and, and especially where you elaborate on, on the slippages among feminist spaces and, and, and women claiming space in the city and, and the tactics of, of gentrification and corporate logics. And, and I mean, for instance, where the real estate investors start to cater for the, the, the feelings of insecurity of women and, and, and maybe also girls, we will we'll talk about that later. Or, or when, we f yeah, when we find that out that in the city, maybe young girls think about shopping streets as the most safe spaces, you know? Um, so I can imagine that the feminist city is also a way to get beyond a sometimes hollow real estate and city branding discourse on, on diversity and inclusive cities. Yes, thank you. And your comment uh, reminded me of the, the, the other thing that I wanted to say in response to <laughs> Alessandra, which was um, her kind of question about like, how do we build up sort of community or city capacity for like caring for one another for doing that community based work and and again from a Western perspective, but I think probably this is extra heightened in the context of a space that is undergoing military occupation is that even you know long before the COVID crisis, for example, we've been, um, our cities have been moving in a direction of sort of increased militarization, police presence, um, the cultivating of fear of, of other people, um, the cultivating of a sense of danger so that we can kind of justify expanding policing, expanding surveillance, all of these kinds of things. And then when we come to a moment of crisis like this, where there should be sort of a feeling of pulling together, we, we see things like people uh, refusing to do basic things like wearing a mask, which is an example, which is an expression of, you know, care for people in your community, right? If you're going to wear a mask, it's a way of saying, I understand my responsibility to you. Um, it's a very simple thing, right? But the fact that for many people, they, uh, they want to refuse that suggests to me that we've long been building up this sense of distrust towards one another of, of not you know, understanding ourselves as part of a collective, part of a community. And so I guess moving forward, 
I, I would like to think, you know, in all cities, but again, I'm sure this is heightened in places with a military occupation that uh, you can't kind of have these conditions for sort of real collective flourishing under this situation where there's so much fear kind of baked into the built environment. Yes, yes. And uh, before we go to Elle's her uh, presentation, I have, have maybe uh, one last question. And because in, in your presentation, you have also pointed to how care work is to a large extent made invisible because it is pushed back back into the individual sphere of the house and, and the housing unit. Uh, and I think that was uh, confronting for a lot of uh, men <laughs> who, were, who were locked down uh, at home and, and, and now could see all the homework and, and the homemaking work uh, that is being um, delivered there. So then, because it's also tying in with my, my own uh, interests, I, I, I was actually wondering what do you think is the potential of housing and, and housing investments and, and house ownership um, for the feminist uh, city? And, and maybe also, uh, what are the risks if we think back about the gentrification processes and, 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 and you know, all these co housing, um, new housing models such as co housing? who that actually to, to a certain extent um, maybe privatize um, things that are normally in the community? Mm, that's a great question. Yeah, the housing piece is so important and, and uh, my thinking on it, which, which may be somewhat limited, honestly, has just been to, to um, argue that there has been too much, still too much focus on the single family home as the right way to live that assumes a kind of family form that is probably not the majority in, in many cities. I know in my hometown of Toronto, they say something like one third of households are actually single people, which poses its own problems in a pandemic when people are forced to kind of lock down into their household of one. Um, so I've been thinking, you know, is it about expanding the variety of kind of households that we can have? Is that, does that involve, you know, different forms of zoning in cities? Does that involve different kind of legislative and policy interventions to make new forms of ownership, renting, uh, co-living possible in ways that are kind of limited right now? But as you say, there is a sort of risk of some of those things being commodified, becoming um, different sorts of markers of, of status and, and symbol in the city and perhaps even becoming gentrified. So, you know, overall the push has to be for, for much greater levels of public investment in affordable housing, something that, you know, in many places we've seen a decrease in over, over many years. Yes, and Alessandra, probably it's uh, not only about household composition, but also it has a kind of ethnic and, and cultural and um, even religious aspect. Maybe you would uh, like to say a word uh, on that. Well, um, if, if this is for, for me, well, I have just one, well, um, uh, I have just one, one let's say, uh, blind spot, not really, but um, that what is overlapping here now in the, I would say in uh, in the um, in all Asia is this kind of overlap of uh, neoliberal way of making cities. So um, when I'm trying to imagine um, the scenarios uh, proposed in uh, in your book, um, I I wonder what space for emancipation we can foresee in neoliberal metropolis like those in Asia, where we have this kind of tension between what remains of a very collective lifestyle and the need of being together while the metropolis is setting families, um, is setting families apart and, and pushing towards more individual lifestyle and more individual ways also of participating to the city, which is also related to income and education. So what I could see is that so many women also that are claiming for more feminist and more inclusive cities eventually do not notice that they still propose it in a paradigm that is not, let's say, reforming 
the, the problem of a neoliberal city that is based on income and class. So I was wondering, I would like to see, to know a little bit your vision about this problematic scenario. <laughs> um, oh gosh, if only I had a, an answer for that <laughs> question. It's, it's not an easy one. Um, you know, ultimately, I, I do think that a, a feminist vision has to be, um, you know, very much paired with a kind of an anti-capitalist, anti-neoliberal vision of the city, because certainly those are um, ways of being that exacerbate all sorts of gender inequalities, as well as create different kinds of gender inequalities. So um, to me, yeah, a feminist city is also a, a challenge to the neoliberal city and it's a challenge to the ideology of neoliberalism, of self-sufficiency and individualism. It's a challenge to um, the idea of austerity. It's a challenge to the idea of um, competition as necessary for urban growth, all, all of those sorts of things. So I'm afraid I, I don't have the most <laughs> concrete answer to that question because it's that's like, that's the big question. That's the big revolutionary <laughs> yes, question, yes. isn't it? <laughs> that's the question behind I, I everything really we are discussing um, tonight, I think. But yeah. I, I think I would now like to go to um, to our next speaker and, and give Els de Vos the floor. So Els de Vos, very, very well, um, welcome also to this uh, debate. You are an engineer, trained as an engineer, architect and urban planner, and now um, associate professor at uh, the Faculty of Design Science sciences uh, uh, at the University of Antwerp and, and uh, where she is lecturing uh, in the field of architectural theory um, and, and interior design and um, I'm very happy that you are here to also say something uh, on uh, the, the exhibition you are now co-curating uh, entitled Fi Female Symbols and Urban Space uh, in Brussels and, and, and maybe we also have a kind of shared uh, past with the co-creation of another exhibition living in the diversity in, in, in the single which is uh, worth mentioning here and I'm, I'm very happy that you are here and, and the floor is yours else. Yeah, I think the mic was uh, turned switched off. So I think that um, I would like to ask you to restart from the beginning so that everyone can hear you. Okay. Thank you. From a perspective in Flanders and Belgium that is even less global than, than the perspective of Leslie, but with, with the artworks, um, artists visualize future views and so in that sense um, you will get new uh, views. Like here you see the visualization of women places on the city map of Antwerp, so it's visualizing another city. Um, my, my presentation will be based on the one hand on architecture, history and planning theory, on international more, on women, gender and feminism with some case studies in Belgium and combined with artworks from the exhibition uh, in Brussels that is running until the end of January in the Amazone um, Huis. Um, yes, I will start historically with Living in a Man-Made World with um, one of the first books, Marion Roberts, um, who, um, yeah, who argued that the whole um, city and the housing environments are made for men, also public transport, um, and even the plan she showed for the social housing in Britain. You see the man sitting in, the f in front of the fireplace and the wife doing the dishes with the children at the table. So that was the ideal that um, was there. Um, and the first books were also all kind of uh, challenges to, um, uh, to f that you have to face in public space. 
and the ideology of separated spheres. It was already said that mainly in the 19th century it became very strong. Uh, on the one hand, you had the public domain, um, wi um, which was a male domain, and then the domestic space, the private space, was seen as the female responsibility, actually for, for the bourgeois women. So the bourgeois women had also to walk a night on the streets, and um, the public woman, a man, yeah, is, was to be in public, but the public woman had another uh, meaning. So it shows that she doesn't belong in public as, as a man. Um, and John Ruskin, uh, who wrote this in his architectural text, the woman's power is for rule, not for battle, and her intellect is for invention or creation, but for sweet ordering, arrangement, and decision. The man in his work in open world must encounter all peril and trial, but he guards the women from all this. Um, and uh, in the same line, Mark Quigley um, interprets the text of Alberti. Ah, oh, yeah, I have to continue, okay. Uh, yes, Mark Quigley, um, in his uh, interpretation of the text of uh, Alberti, the role of architecture is explicitly the control of sexuality, or more precisely, the chastity of the girl, the fidelity of the wife. And the uh, uh, artwork of Bourgeois, Louise Bourgeois, show how the uh, wife and the, the home are intertwined with each other. Um, um, but also, the city is not only a male place, as Elizabeth Wilson shows, the, anonymi the anonymity of the city offers and offered opportunities for women. It's also the place for workers women who could walk for free there, for the, the feminist movement, the LBGT movement. It's on one of the terraces in Paris, Simone de Beauvoir wrote her book La Deuxième Six, and women could also explore the city disguised as a flaneur. So it also had opportunities and it should um, look um, like that. Um, yeah, it doesn't work. That yeah, okay. Um, so Elizabeth said, the discourse that has shaped our cities um, has limited our vision and almost destroyed our cities. It is time for a new vision, a new idea of life in the city, and a new feminine voice in praise of cities. And this artwork showed how women dream of other cities or scream for another vision on the city. Um, then the third, oh, it's too fast now. Um, going back. Ah. Ah, this, okay. Ah. It's I want to go back, actually. Yes, more. Go back. One more. Yes, this one. Um, so then in the 90s you had books that showed discrimination by design in planning and in architecture. Um, next now. Oh, no, it's too fast. There is something with that slide. Um, so, still one back. Else maybe you can just say next slide and then, and then uh, it will they will uh, okay, do it. I will you. do it like yes. that. Yeah. Okay, um, so yeah, I could also not um, um, go around the issue of unsafety in the city. There are uh, many reports. Uh, over the world, also in Brussels, there was recently a report, and even now today, one third of women avoid public transport uh, because of uh, safety issues. So safety should be mentioned, although it's something that come back time again and again. And also in the exhibition, uh, next slide, um, uh, there was um, a video in which the fear of women was internalized. So it showed how women have a voice in their head and are thinking the whole time uh, of being unsafe, of being responsible for walking there, especially at night, for the clothing they have, a short skirt and so on. Uh, so it's and uh, this artist Manon de Schacht, um, she visualizes um, the the assaults and the insults that women have to face when walking the street, and so they are printed on her uh, fashion collection. Yes. However, although all the violence in the street, it's already said also by Leslie, domestic violence is uh, main. 
is maybe worse than in than or, or in, in a bigger amount than um, in the city. Uh, one of five women in Belgium is a victim of violence by the partner, and 70 women a year die in Belgium uh, as a result of partner violence. So that's more than one a week. That's really a lot. And the quarantine it doesn't protect against uh, domestic violence. Um, that is sure. Um, but discrimination in the city, it's also said, um, and the toilets come back also in Belgium, the activist group Do Not Silence My Bladder, initiated by Baharak Bashar, uh, argued for um, gender equality in urban planning. It's a basic need. And um, as she showed, next slide, um, there are uh, toilets and uh, urinals for men in 157 locations in Ghent, for example. For uh, dogs, there are 120 places for dogs. And for women, there are 38 locations where they can find a toilet. And why the city has 5,500 more female inhabitants than men, in the city. So it is not um, a luxury problem, it's really a basic necessity. And it's not only about space, it's also about perception. Um, men risk uh, a fine for uh, peeing in public, the hospital, but women also risk a fine for public indecency, which is a, f uh, which is a criminal record and can go up to 3,000 uh, euros. So it's more than just um, men or women, it makes a difference. Um, and also in this book, it took until um, 92 before the first women's toilet was installed uh, on the US Senate floor. So previously, female senators had to queue in line with the tourists downstairs. So that tells a lot about the position of men and women in society related to power. But then to come to fair shared cities, where are the female places? Where can we find um, women? Um, we, uh, yeah, next slide, um, I will focus on four categories. There are more, but these are um, coming up um, explicitly also in works that is done. Um, the public interiors, the galleries, it was not by chance that the prostitute was shown in a gallery as they often were their working place. And the nowadays version of that, next slide, is the shopping mall. It's also mentioned and you see in the publicity who is target, the middle class female woman. Next slide, but you also have the public interior, the public libraries, for example. Next slide, and when you look between 20 years old and 70 years old, 60 up to 70% of the lenders are female in Flanders. So it shows that it's a very important place uh, for women. Yes, then another category are the public parks. Um, I did a study um, long ago actually on three parks in Ghent and one was clearly um, a women park, the Rommel Water Park at the right um, up. Um, next slide. And this park, it worked so well because on the one hand, there was social control. All the houses surrounding the park have their eyes uh, with the windows on, on the park, so there's control. There are only three small entrances, so also it has a kind of protected character. And next slide. And the layout of the park, it's a uh, layout in zo zones in a kind of rooms, you can say. There are sport rooms, mainly occupied by men, petanque field by older men, but also you have the, the play garden, and there you find women, also um, American women, and it's really the place, children and women, uh, you find there together. And as the, the park is zoned, it allows dif um, diversity of people visiting that park. And you see other examples like in Scharwijk, St. Jos Node, the street is dominated by men. But if you go further, um, next slide, it are in the parks nearby that you find the women. Um, here, for example, this one, Rune Koningen. Next slide, also the same park. There is, um, there is surveillance there, um, paid surveillance by European subsidies. And another park, St. Jos Node, St. Francisco's Park, also nearby. That's where you find the women and children um, in that area. 
And the, the zoning, I said it already in, for example, Place Maurichard in Saint-Gilles, uh, Louis van Brande did the research there and the zones, you see similar, the sport fields in the zones, they are uh, for men. The so-called neutral zones are also used by men, men and women legitimize their presence in the zone where the children are playing. It's like they need a legitimation to be there. And she also noticed a self-regulation of women's behavior. They had feeling we shouldn't go there, but we can go there and so on. If you want to read more, uh, you can find it in this book on gender in uh, the French-speaking part of Belgium. And then another interesting uh, study on um, Deune Noord, where you only find almost uh, men on the streets, from Moroccan origin mainly. Um, Sharzat, a student of urban planning, looked for places for women and found that the daily markets were was a very important place where women gather, and they also could legitimize their presence there by doing shopping, the groceries, and so on. So it was a very important place to meet. Um, and then affordable housing, it's already said. Um, there was a study by Dominique Van Neste, professor of geography in KU Leuven, who showed um, for Ghent that single women prefer to live in the city near, near the provisions, female heads as well, um, more than the male counterparts who live more in the surroundings. Um, but women are also the one who rent more a house than men, so it's their income as the yeah, reason of divorce is often lower. So they are in the 19th century built with poorer quality houses. Um, but so a good um, social housing uh, rental market is very important to, um, to yeah, um, support women in the city. And then the last um, item claiming the city. Um, yeah, next. Um, on the level of city planning, the contribution of women remains often marginalized in mainstream stream planning. Next slide, as uh, Leonie Sandercock um, says, she pleads for the inclusion of uh, planning from below. And next slide, also Sue Handler, um, she noticed, she uh, did a study to uh, women planners of the 40s and 70s, and their contribution was marginalized as backup work. So they mainly realized housing projects for senior and disabled people or community services, but that was backup work. It was no real planning, according to the main discourse. Um, what representation are is an another thing that is very important. It's also stressed by Leslie Kern in Geneva, uh, where they um, uh, included more traffic signs. Famous traffic signs is a nice example of that. Um, in Belgium, in the exhibition, uh, there was an, an organization who included um, um, flags and flags made by uh, women artist cooperatives, which, uh, which evolved according to the season and celebrated friendship instead of it was as a, a reaction against national symbols. Uh, then another project of Open Belgium uh, Brussels that Belgium that um, mapped the the names of the streets and the gender, and only seven percent in Brussels has a female name, and then often it's a virgin or a queen or something. Uh, why the men are the heroes um, often, uh, but there's there is you see that uh, many also colonial street names are replaced by women's names, so that's a good evolution, and also in Flanders. Um, uh, Sophie Le Maire um, uh, is uh, doing action to change, uh, to bring in more female street names. And then the last one on the level of the body, the body was also mentioned yeah, with the toilet, but this artist, Claude uh, Lepage, she noticed that in, um, in public, men often use uh, two places, seating places, by spreading their uh, legs. And so she said, let's do something similar for women and stretching the elbows. Um, and she made a video of this, uh, next slide, and why women automatically step aside when, when being confronted with a man. Some men just walk um, yeah, against these uh, women. So um, the experiment was not so successful, but it says a lot about women in place. And finally, I want to thank you with this artwork of Ololo, who did a workshop with women to um, yeah, to, to, to put their body in, in a um, clay pl plaster to show the diversity of uh, female bodies. It's not only the commercial um, models, but uh, the everyday uh, women that they want to bring into the city. Thank you. Thank you, Ed. Else, um, 
I really liked your presentation and, and I also really appreciated the historical perspective you mm -hmm. brought in and also the artistic point of view, which is, I think, very important also in a kind of more activist way. Mm -hmm. um, so thank you for that. Mm -hmm. um, I think there are many points that we could um, expand on, uh, also, for instance, the private public thresholds and so on. But I first would like to give the floor uh, to Alessandra uh, um, to respond on your presentation. Alessandra, the floor is yours. Um, thank you very much, Els. Um Hello. Uh, can you hear me? Perhaps? Yes, yes, yes. Okay, that's good. So thank you very much for this presentation. It has so, so many contents. I, I'm very triggered. So also because uh, there is a little bit of overlap between uh, some places that you showed for uh, as research materials and places where I actually worked uh, as a researcher for a while. So super interesting for me. So. Um, uh, I have just a, a couple of um, of thoughts that um, that came to my mind while you were speaking, which is um, about um, the fact that when we talk about a public space, um, there is something th that is in common in between public space and gender, which is that they are both actually culturally constructed. So um, and somehow. The, the public space, we can say that is um, an, uh, a domain where uh, we project ourselves, uh, taking from Edwards' whole uh, concepts of proxemics, it's, we can think about a public space as a place where uh, we project how we think about ourselves within a certain situation that is uh, that is an urban one, uh, that is a, it's a social and a spatial situation. So uh, you mentioned several times in your examples the presence of, um, um, let's say, non-Belgian communities, so like um, uh, uh, people from Moroccan origins, of course. Um, and uh, this reminds me that uh, their gender structure uh, is rather uh, specific, of course, uh, if you compare it with, I don't know, uh, for example, uh, Northern European and uh, Belgian idea um, of gender. And this reflects also uh, and, uh, and goes hand in hand with the conceptualization of what is public, a public space and what the two genders, let's say two genders to simplify, um, are what men and women are supposed to do in those spaces. Um, uh, I don't know if I can maybe share one uh, one image um, that I was um, that you reminded me. Uh, I don't know if I can do it. If you can see yeah, that uh, now, um, there is a confrontation that I recently had between two spaces. One I don't know if you can see it. One is um, uh, in, uh, in like a case in uh, in. Uh, uh, Palestine and a case uh, in, uh, in in Brussels, so in, in Molenbeek, Sintians. And um, what what I was noticing is that there are some similarities, although the space is completely different. Um, there are those gender attitudes that are Southern Mediterranean, Levantine, so Moroccan, and as well from uh, the Middle East of uh, the attitude of men and women in certain spatial settings uh, repeats also in other contexts that are spatially different but are inhabited by people that have similar gender ideas. So, and um, I was wondering when you were talking about uh, like um, to uh, look more at, uh, like to accommodate more perspective um, into the urban, uh, like shaping the city, how you would see, um, how you would include, for example, this presence of multicultural ideas about the city and what is public and what, and the, the trajectory of gender uh, development, let's say, say transformation of gender constructs in a place like, for example, Brussels, where you have so many communities that may have conflicting ideas, from where would you start? Mm -hmm. 
Um, yes, it's, it's an interesting question and we are increasingly more um, confronted with it. Um, well, although Kathleen Peleman, she did already study in 2005 or something and she noticed the same things that we noticed now last year in, in Deurne Noord in Antwerp. Um, and first of all, knowledge of the differences s there it starts with. So it's not only about gender, uh, men and women, but it's also about religion. And, and so religion brings in another um, uh, lens. And so um, she divided up two categories. You have uh, the married women and the free women and the married men and the free men. And so in, in, um, in restaurants, there are zones where families can sit and there are zones separated by plants, for example, where the, the free man, the bachelor sits and their women are not allowed to sit. And those sensibilities you have to know for sure that it starts with that to know, okay, how can I deal with it and you see that they deal with uh, plants in between the two rooms and so you can have the two publics. So a diversity of rooms, once you know the, the sensibilities, the sensitivities, you have to start, I think, to design and make it as inclusive as possible. Of course, you will never catch everybody and everything, but um, you can um, have certain um, sen sensitivities in your design. And there, I think, working in separated rooms, a kind of outdoor rooms, it's an important one. Like um, in Borgerhout, there was a square, and of the moment that there were men, the, the, the mother with the children, it was a Moroccan woman as well, she left the square and was in home with the children the whole Wednesday afternoon, which is so pity. But if the square would have had two parts, then there could have been a part for the children and especially with the playground so that it's al already claimed for women, it could help her to stay in that part and men would be less interested in that part. It would be for children. So I think by creating a diversity, making there are men's, well, there are enough but yeah, men's spaces, but also other spaces, it's a start to deal with those things. But I think there is a lot, yeah, um, yeah, a lot of study to, to, to do. Another thing are swimming pools. Um, uh, certain swimming pools have women's days and on that moment the 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 women the Moroccan women go there so it's it's sometimes about um, um, making um, not spatial rooms but in time temporal uh, rooms so I think there are a lot of possibilities and it starts with uh, yeah, investigating them we invited then the 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 man of the city uh, who was in charge of social um, social inclusion and he was really surprised by our study why Kathleen Peleman said it's already 20 years like that so th so the city has to start to know what are their needs and then can start thinking how uh, will we intervene in it but so parks are very important because the streets um, they were almost only occupied by men. So it was really, where are the women? That was the first search. And then in the park we found them and then the markets. And then also childcare was a very important one and one that um, you don't need to know the language to, 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 to care for children. So that was also a step. Um, and then community centers often in a house. So it's, it has a dom it's, it's this domestic environment, but it's a place where women meet. That were a kind of uh, stones to, um, to, give to empower the women there, actually. If I can just say one thing, you said this very last uh, uh, point is very important, like the idea that public spaces are not forcibly outdoors, especially mm -hmm. for certain cultures that are very much indoor but they are actually coven squares so it's very very a uh, very thoughtful point that often is overlooked mm -hmm. i think it's also uh, if i may it 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 brings us also by the way or to to a reflection on how we do research and and i think that uh, leslie has also pointed to to that um and to certain more innovative uh, methods of research, for instance, participatory action research, etc. But also, I think, um, 
we can have here a kind of reflection on the positionality of the researcher herself, mm -hmm. because uh, it's also something that you write about, Leslie, I think, um, about your partial perspective that you can provide as a middle class uh, woman of course and 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 what it obscures and and how you can start thinking about that so i think it's also about how we produce knowledge mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. which kind of narratives are we um yeah including in in this knowledge production so so leslie maybe you would like to react on on that sure thank you uh that that kind of dovetails with what i was um, one of the things that I, I wanted to um, react to or highlight from, from Elsa's presentation, which uh, thank you very much for, for sharing that, was um, the importance of the everyday, right? And how so many of the kind of um, gender differences, if we will, in the experience of the city are really expressed and found in these like very uh, sort of minute, mundane, uh, sort of banal moments. They're not necessarily found in the moments of kind of profound conflict, although that that does exist, or or a moment of like um, violence, for example. But just in the everyday way that people sit, the way that they walk down the street or move down the street, um, I found it really interesting. The point about uh, women's sort of self regulation, which again is at this very micro level, probably almost an unconscious level uh, until somebody asks you about it or points it out to you. And we, you know, I talk about that a little bit in the book with respect to issues of, of fear and the way that women kind of self-regulate our clothing, our walk, who we make eye contact with, all of that. So, and that connects back to this question of research methods as well. Like, do we have methods and do we have, um, researchers who are able to either through embedded methods, ethnography, participatory methods, through their own positionality, able to access some of that everydayness, because I think we learned so much about city life and about power from uh, the seemingly banal, easily overlooked interactions of day-to-day of -day life. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I agree that um, it also starts in, in the, who are the planners, is there a, is there a mix? like the, the research on the Moroccan women in Dune Noord, it was made by an Iranian um, woman and uh, her mother could speak Arabic, so she couldn't interview the older women, but her mother went with her, did those interviews, she could talk with the younger women. So um, that, that was a very crucial thing. We wouldn't never get so far to understand what these places meant for them. And so, um, including more it, um, ethnic diversity and, and ethnicity and stuff, it's for sure, it's the first thing and yeah. Um, and then, yeah, but then the Belgian context in which professors need to speak Dutch within three or four years and have to have an attest, it doesn't help, of course, to make it more diverse. Eh? It's, um, yes, yes, exactly. But what might help us is probably um, looking to, uh, or. or giving more attention to pr practitioners and, and, and trying mm -hmm. to set up a kind of transdisciplinary framework uh, for our research. And I think that, of course, neatly brings us to our next speaker, uh, Sabine Midema, who is uh, actually a sociologist and urban planning and working on participation, child-friendly public space and mobility at and Sam leaving, I will translate it as child and society, but maybe you can uh, also explain a little bit more on that. And, and you will um, exp yeah, explaining or presenting insights for, uh, from your upcoming uh, publications on girls and public space, which really relates very well to the, the presentation of ELS, I think. The floor is yours, Sabine. So thank you. Uh, where you talked about is... Uh, yeah, I can see it uh, clearly in my research as well. It's not uh, easy to uh, go into uh, other ethnic ethnicities' minds, but then also go t into girls, eh, another age as well. Um, I come from a small village, so I, I don't know how it is to be brought up in a city. Uh, so all these things are, are really, yeah, I recognize it uh, a lot. Um, but yeah, so um, I'm um, action researcher, we can say, and also policy advisor to uh, cities uh, in Flanders and Brussels as well. 
Um, oh yeah, and here I have the pointer, a, a lot of techniques. Um, so uh, next week I'm, um, uh, we are going to um, public publicate our publication about girls uh, publish uh, our publication about girls in public space it will be in dutch but maybe uh, one day in english as well but um, there are a lot of pictures in it <laughs> so if you want to see it i will present it in english now so you'll get an uh, insight of it um, let me see if this pointer is going to work yes um, so why did we do the research uh, is the first question uh, to to answer um, we do a lot of research, action research uh, on, on children and uh, teenagers, uh, but we see that uh, girls are less in public space and we, we just saw it from our practice. But we also did uh, research last year uh, in Flanders in seven different neighborhoods in different cities and villages. And we counted the children who were playing outside. Uh, and there we counted that um, uh, a lot less girls are playing outside in comparison to boys uh, in uh, so we counted in 2009-19 and it was 37 girls out of 100 children um, and if we compare it uh, to 2008 it was really a setback so it was 45 out of 100 children in 2008 so the numbers is going down um, it's uh, getting more unequal and that's not a good sign uh, because it's not only in cities but also in villages um, and um, what it was also very um, interesting uh, is that especially in the age group of nine uh, between nine and 11 years old it was problematic um, it, uh, there was a big underrepresentation of girls in this age group um, of um, other things that are interested to to know is that uh, girls are more um, um, focused on social play so they they really like to talk and chill and then play again so more this combination of meeting each other and and playing uh, that's what we s also saw in this uh, research uh, and then the, the 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 most important why is of course uh, going to a towards uh, an inclusive public play space for all children so can go to the next slide. Uh, how did we do it? Um, we worked together with uh, four cities um, um, and uh, we worked in Ghent, Mechelen, Antwerp and Leuven. There were four very different contexts. Um, one was for example in Antwerp Kielpark, which is a very big park uh, but also with a lot of social houses uh, around it uh, but also with a shopping center uh, which was mentioned already. Um, for Ghent it was a whole neighborhood very dense neighborhood, Sluizig Tolhuis Ham for the people who know it. And then Mechelen, we had uh, a neighborhood that was uh, very uh, behind the, sta the, st uh, the train station, so it was a bit, you know, uh, not centered and, uh, and a bit, yeah, uh, on the uh, outside of, th of the city center. And then the last one was in Leuven, was more mixed residential, but also a lot of social housing. Um, we we uh, went for the age group of from 10 to 12 years old. Uh, there are a lot of <laughs> interesting age groups, but we chose this one because uh, this uh, this age group is the first step to to go um, outside independently or trying to get more autonomy from your parents. Um, but at the same time, you're still very focused as a child on the neighborhood because yeah, you cannot go uh, further than that uh, without your parents. So you can go to the next slide. Um, here you can see some of the practices we did, the methods. Uh, we went outside, of course, but we also made colleges uh, like this. Yeah. Pinterest kind of things, but also from our own um, library, we had we have a lot of photos uh, in stock, and uh, they could choose uh, the photos they wanted to, and then explain it to us. And then you go to the next slide. Uh, we made a lot of scale models, maquettes in Dutch, um, and it was also very nice to see how they presented it to other children as well, and to see uh, to compare the the, the spaces uh, they made. 
Um, and you go to the next slide. And then um, lastly, we also had like uh, di dialogues with local policy makers. Uh, the children really, the girls really liked it because they could really talk with the adults who are really changing the city or ho they hope that they will change the city one day. And they showed them around the neighborhood and uh, girls were very professionally in, in, uh, in explaining um, what their needs are and what they, what they would like to see changed. Uh, and what can also stay that was also important so um, and then a bit about like the the results or what the the girls told us um, is first thing that, that that they always mentioned is that girls are as brave or bad as we say as boys um, they are looking for adventure and challenge um, it's also yeah um, um, really yeah f uh, on this age group from 10 to 12 year you are really focused on adventure and uh, challenging yourself so I think that's really normal uh, uh, good <laughs> behavior to to go for adventure and then um, this mix of playing and chilling was very uh, very important uh, how do um, but on the other side there were also some let's say borders or or problematic situations where it was a bit more difficult for girls to to go out and play is that uh, most importantly the play spaces are um, a lot of times claimed by certain groups because in these cases where we did the research there is not enough play space in the city I think that's something in general we don't have enough play space so there is always a group claiming a certain space um, and uh, girls are mostly uh, last in line so first are you have the older boys if there are no older boys playing then there's the younger younger boys playing if they don't play then it's time for the girls to say okay this is now my space so for example yeah the the simple example for ex uh, is uh, a soccer or football field that is claimed by one group um, and also all girls would like to play more uh, often outside they really like to play often of, uh, outside in the city um, they don't have yeah they 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 are not ashamed, for example, to play outside. They really like to go out, but there are certain things that yeah, uh, stick. Let them stick to their uh, own own home. For example, inside is easier. It's more comfortable. Uh, yeah, it, y it's a known space. You know who the uh, the people are in this space. You do there are no unknown people. Um, the other thing is that it's sometimes difficult to to meet with your friends because they are living in another neighborhood um, and uh, all these internet things uh, make it diffi more difficult uh, to meet with your friends uh, because you can also stay inside and just meet online and um, yeah the, the last thing is uh, that there are no nearby place uh, sp areas and that they're dependent on the parents for example there was one girl um, who told me that she uh, could go uh, play in a park uh, but only if her father was going to the mosque because the mosque was next to the play space and in the time that the father is in the mosque she can go to the play space which is actually good but uh, she has to wait until the father goes to the mosque of course uh, can go to the next slide uh, and so um, the girls brought uh, brought me to um, um, yeah, specify uh, 10 design principles um, uh, yeah, I found them through this action research and uh, and gather them together. Um, so first we have landscape thinking. I will explain more about it uh, in the next slides. Um, you have meeting places where y yeah, t a, a certain places where where you can meet uh, uh, to see friends. Things are going on there. Uh, you can see things, for example. Um, you have um, sitting areas and adventurous play space is important. Make the city green. That's all, all what all the children say. You can go to the next slide. And then uh, playful water was very important. So not only to look at it, but also go with sh at least your feet into the water. Uh, as uh, it's again this adventurous uh, team that girls want to to you know. Challenge and go out and see how this works and so on. Uh, then you have ch shelter and hiding places. Uh, for example, a tree to sit under, to to have some shade in summer, but also to h hide from the rain in the winter. In uh, in uh, yeah, in the winter time. 
um, then you have place for imagination that means like uh, dancing, uh, theater, singing. Uh, you know, the, the TikTok is very popular also with the girls, especially from 10 to 12. Um, and then you have lighting, which is very important for the for the safety. And uh, the, uh, the last one is a use of materials. So do, do not only think about what is in the space, but also how does it look like, which colors uh, you use, etc. Uh, so a bit more into the examples. I cannot show everything because it will take too long, uh, but I took out um, four, I think. Um, the first one is uh, landscape thinking. Uh, this is a very general uh, uh, principle. In this case, like we focused uh, a lot on the, the play spaces itself, so playgrounds, uh, and uh, which was already mentioned, for example, in the Maurice Shore uh, example in Brussels, in the different examples uh, else showed us, is that you shouldn't focus on one uh, certain activity on a playground, but on different uh, activities. So, for example, the, the left um, a down uh, photo, you see uh, a, a, a maquette. Uh, model a scale model <laughs> um, from the children uh, with a very diverse um, uh, design so you have um, um, on the right uh, on the right you have this uh, soccer playground they say it's it's possible and they also like to play soccer girls they, they, they really like to do it as well or to play basketball as well but don't make it too big don't make it yeah, like the center part of the play space put it in a corner somewhere <laughs> um, but also make space for uh, a diverse um, uh, space where f uh, just a, a piece of grass or a, a, a yeah um, a landscape uh, where you can play, where you can sit, where you can dance, where you can do multiple things. That is very important. Uh, then you have um, uh, on the right side on of the photo, you see also the girls explaining um, uh, what they want to change. And this is a very nice example because it's on their own playground. Uh, it's next to a youth work center uh, where they go. And they told us that uh, on the, the left side you have the older boys uh, chilling and they have their own space and on the right side of the playground you have this bench where the girls can sit um, but before there was a tree and because of the droughts um, uh, the, 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 the tree died and yeah uh, the uh, municipality came to uh, to get it out but the girls couldn't yeah, say goodbye to it so they were a bit sad so they told uh, the um, uh, the policy maker to bring back a new tree uh, so to say like this is our space we we can share a space but give us some uh, some space uh, the other solution they gave us is to to put a girls uh, place space uh, on on the roof of the of the youth work uh, center <laughs> so I, I thought that was very uh, creative as well um, you can go to the next slide then this adventurous play space is, is just very important and I can understand you want to play and you want to, to see it big. Uh, and uh, high towers were very uh, important for the girls. Um, uh, towers are uh, yeah, challenging to go on, but also s to sit on and see everything around you, to, to have a broad view of all the people playing and, and talk with, with other girls. Uh, it's yeah, it's a really your own uh, space, um, and then you have other examples. Uh, uh, above you see uh, the trampolines, and they say we really want to spring, uh, to, to 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 jump. I mean, uh, because we are wild. Uh, it's saying in Dutch, uh, <laughs> so <laughs> uh, they're telling us itself. And then on the right side, you can see a s you see a giant um, building with a with a slide where you co can uh, go on. So the next slide. Uh, green space is also very important. I think we were in very uh, dense uh, um, uh, neighborhoods, um, but for example, Kill Park has a lot of green space, uh, but there is a difference between just seeing uh, um, uh, green uh, spaces where you can watch the flowers and so on, and on the other side, green space where you can play in. So. Um, 
they were much more focused on playing in the green space. Um, for example, uh, the um, tree um, a house is, is a very classic um, uh, solution uh, of, of playing in a in a green area, but also uh, the, the trees, the tra tree trunks on the ground. Uh, it's saying um, you can climb on it, you can sit on it, you can walk uh, around it, you can picnic it uh, at this place. And there must also be a water fountain because otherwise we will die, it's saying, but <laughs> we will we will start from the not drinking the water. Um, <laughs> so uh, you need a lot of things <laughs> around uh, the green space. And um, and above you can see a big hill. Um, the, the hill was already there. It's, it's in Leuven, uh, but it's concrete uh, now and there is already a playground on it. But they said uh, make it green and uh, put a tree on top of the hill. So it's very clear like this must be the center of, of the playground. And the uh, last one are the sitting areas. Um, also uh, a lot of attention to this one from the girls. Um, uh, simply said, don't make simple benches which you see everywhere in the parks because yeah, there can only be maximum three, four people on it, but you cannot have a good conversation on it because you cannot see each other. You want to go into dialogue, so you, you want to see their, uh, each other's faces, so make around um, uh, benches, uh, make more creative benches, make benches, uh, yeah, adventure benches, artful benches, uh, make it creative. Um, and it's also seen in the examples uh, over here. So I think we are on the la last slide. <laughs> I hope you are still uh, following. Um, to support outdoor play for ch uh, for girls and for ch children in general, um, or four things to think of: um, monitor the public character of the public space. Uh, uh, um, try to avoid disclaiming uh, of of play space of public spaces. Uh, everybody is welcome, and that's also the the second um, thing where you have to think of is like create safe spaces where you really feel. And that's not so simple to make because you cannot put a sign. This is a safe space. You really have to think about multiple, uh, yeah, uh, different um, f focuses. Uh, uh, on a space, um, there, um, sometimes you you need um, uh, somebody from the municipality to to stay there to make it a good place to organize also activities in this place so make it more welcoming for for everybody and especially for girls um, and bring the girls also to uh, the play spaces because a lot of uh, play spaces are unknown for children they don't know that there is a play space around the corner or that they can just go there t in on their own and play there. S it's really sometimes, yeah, not normal or, or a bit difficult for them because they only play, for example, in the streets. You see it in more dense areas that children more often play in the streets uh, or uh, on the, um, the sidewalk. Um, so yeah, so bring them to the places. I think that's a very uh, important one for youth work to, to work on. And lastly, think about the location accessibility of a play space, uh, because uh, the play space can be close to, to your neighborhood, but if there is a, a, d um, a very um, a difficult uh, crossing, then you will not go uh, to the other side of the, of the road. Voila. Uh, and next week you can see our publication up on our website. That's it. <laughs> for your presentation. Thank mm -hmm. you so much, Sabina, for your presentation. It was a very rich uh, presentation. And I think that also with the COVID pandemic, we have witnessed how important playgrounds and, 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 and public spaces for children and, and how much it functions as a kind of extension of their living space and, mm -hmm. and also what happens uh, when, for instance, with the first peak, all playgrounds were closed off and, wow. and, and it was really increasing to a lot of children's uh, spatial poverty, you could say. And, and I think uh, that you have shown uh, that we, yeah, that, that it was a good decision at least to not <laughs> do that again. Yeah. Um, and, and so I think that um, I would like now to give the floor again to Alessandra. I can imagine that the experience of of girls in Palestine might be quite uh, different in public, uh, different in public space. Although there probably 
are also similarities, I think. Uh. Oh, well, I think uh, everything starts from a completely different spatial layout. So uh, this fantastic richness of, uh, of kids' park and playgrounds here is something that being something that do not, doesn't generate money, it's not built. So, and it's not taken into account in urban standards. So we had just a few days ago, a very heated debate uh, within a, a university about this kind of practice. So um, of course, kids uh, here uh, tend to play in uh, um, empty, in empty plots that are still vacant from being built. So it's completely something, something different. It's a little bit more wild perhaps, but it's true that still I notice a similarity about uh, this kind of, of um, edge, this kind of threshold related to age that from nine to 10 years up, girls tends to a little bit like be less present and then they appear again when they are a little bit older. I think there is again this kind of um, um, uh, concern about uh, uh, girl security uh, that we are uh, perhaps uh, more vulnerable for all a series of situations. And uh, here it, it is also felt. Um, I very much liked uh, um, uh, this presentation and I think that, that kids are fantastic architects. <laughs> <laughs> and I would, I want to, I'm very curious to know whether you had during the, the, the design process an interaction or a feedback from parents somehow, because I can imagine, imagining, for example, uh, being Italian, I was raised up in a very traditional Italian family with a mom extremely concerned about my boundaries and where I go and not to get dirty. I wonder uh, if you had a kind of response from families like, no, no, this thing doesn't work or this is uh, dangerous or something like that. Mm -hmm. uh, um, we didn't um, include the parents into the research because yeah, we wanted to focus mainly on the girls, of course, uh, but we did talk with girls about uh, what uh, the parents think of going outside um, and but it's it's not so easy to 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 ask of course because we were in bigger groups uh, I think sometimes there is yeah there are some certain subjects it's it's a bit uneasy to or taboos to talk about if if they they are allowed to go outside but we did talk about um, uh, for example the differences between boys and girls um, and um, on one hand, they don't say that there is difference because girls can go out, boys can go out. And also the children said that um, their parents sometimes have to push the girls or the, the, the children to get them outside because they really like, you know, to be on, on the computer or tablet. Uh, and it's easy to stay inside. Um, we have to go uh, outside sometimes. Um, uh, what was I talking <laughs> about? Yeah, yeah. Um, no, I think actually that the parents um, are pushing more uh, the the the, g uh, the children outside rather than than let them stay outside, but uh, really asking about um, uh, are you allowed or not that was not really uh, in the into this research. I think you need other methods to to ask this and also to get in contact with the parents themselves as well. But uh, to say that. Um, girls felt like they were uh, hold back to go outside. No, that was not the case at all, but uh, we, I think it's a bit more subtle. But yeah. maybe, uh, Alessandra, I would like to, to turn the question back to you, because I think maybe there is a kind of different uh, kind of um, yeah, expectations towards the behavior of girls and boys in public space in, 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 in the context where you are living, or is that quite the same uh, for that age? I think that, uh, well, uh, I, f I found a kind of uh, blend, uh, like a mild difference that is kind of common within all the Mediterranean area, I would say. So I wouldn't really relate it to kind of like Arabic speaking countries. 
until, uh, well, it, it really starts with the puberty, I would say, when really differences start to be, uh, to be like more noticeable uh, because you get kind of more precisely sexualized. And also you become more like a girl is expected to be more the object of interest uh, from someone that is not, uh, is not welcomed. And at the same time, uh, uh, there is a kind of like difference in educating. And, and then I go back to something that uh, also else was mentioning, a different attitude towards space uh, being more aggressive in the sense of men um, and boys being having more the attitude or of okay like challenge your boundaries take your space so you can spread your legs for example it's very subtle but then it reflects to the public space in the wider and even in office work eventually and why instead like the good girl is polite she doesn't ask uh, she doesn't ask too much space, she doesn't ask too much time, so there is again this tendency of withdrawing because older boys are there, because, uh, because uh, the parents say to come back, etc. So, but I have the feeling, like I could find this kind of, maybe more subtle, but still this kind of attitude also in northern countries. Yes. What else you would like to add? I have a daughter of that age, and um, now she's 11, but last year, or at yeah, the beginning of the year, she wanted to football, and she was. She said, I will bring my ball with me to the school, and he said, oh, you don't have a good one, but yeah, she had a good one from her, her uncle, and then they were very impressed, and they, yeah, she played, and she showed what she could, and they were very impressed, but she, she learned, cert she could certain things, but then at the end, she washed her ball, and uh, it has to be clean again, and they were laughing. You wash your ball. What are you doing? Oh yes, I'm a girl, so I have to wash it. She <laughs> said. So I thought. Uh, so she was very um, stood. What's the word? Very tough. Yeah, brave at her. Yeah, showing off. But then in the end, he had to be washed. Um, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, um, yeah. Do you want to? Yeah. Yeah. Um, I was thinking about the other uh, age groups. Um, I did my master thesis about. Uh, youngsters in public space in Brussels, uh, so the different mm -hmm. age group uh, with boys and girls. And one of the conclusion of my master thesis was that uh, boys stay in uh, certain places, uh, doesn't have to be in their neighborhoods themselves, but in certain places, it most of the time is of course like a soccer uh, playground of or uh, a square or something like that. And uh, girls go uh, to different cent centric places. So for example, the stairs of the Beurs, uh, or uh, the in, in Brussels, the, the really center, that was a place where th they would like to go. But also these shopping malls, which was also mentioned in Leslie, her book, uh, um, uh, I could read, and it was very interesting to go to the shopping mall as a, as a safe space. And uh, that really differs uh, uh, with the young uh, age group, uh, if I compare it. Uh. Yes, indeed. Yeah. Um, Leslie, I think that it in many ways, uh, what Sabine was telling relates to your book and especially I think the chapters uh, the city of moms and the city of friends because when we are talking about girls we're probably also talking about moms and and I was actually thinking that um, also when Els was explaining about the design of the playgrounds and, and, and Sabine of course too with the input of the children that do we don't we actually risk uh, in reproducing certain gender stereotypes and, and even uh, kind of a spatial gender s segregation of the playgrounds where the mothers are placed next to the children uh, and, the f and 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 uh, even myself I can an can witness <laughs> I'm a witness of that that when I go to the playgrounds I'm mostly surrounded with other mothers um, so probably you also have uh, some things to say about that <laughs> Uh, yes, thank you. That's a really great point. And I think it points to the fact that, that spatial interventions don't uh, exist on their own. Um, they, they have to be taken into account in terms of the wider context. So if we 
still have a society where from, you know, even before birth, a gendered assumptions and a kind of binary gender assumption is placed upon, um, you know, fetuses, infants, uh, toddlers, children, then it's, it's to be expected that, that children are going to reflect back some of these gender differences and what they want and what they expect from their, their spaces. So I think if we don't want to fall into that trap of reproducing sort of stereotypical gender norms, then there also has to be that kind of social change piece that is not so focused on, you know, imposing a gender binary or strict definitions of gendered behavior onto children. And I do wonder, I, I think perhaps spaces could play a role in that if they, if there are perhaps spaces where there are less uh, kind of stereotypical activities built right into them. I'm, I'm, I don't know exactly what the answer to that is, but I think, you know, perhaps there's some potential there. Um, I'm also really intrigued just by, you know, the concept of the importance of play in urban space. And I think uh, Luce mentioned, you know, with the, with the pandemic, the, uh, the heightened need or the recognition of the need for children to have uh, play in social spaces, but I think also for adults, right? And what, as our focus has been uh, the city of, of economics, the city of growth, the city of um, development, we have kind of forgotten a vision of the city as a place of social interaction, of a place of fun and, and play. Uh, but of course, we still have to keep in mind some critical questions of, of who has access to those fun spaces. You know, are they as inclusive as they could be? But um, but I, I hope that this moment does encourage us to think about the all the other things that cities can be that are not about economic transactions. I think it's also important to um, uh, look on the different levels we have in a city. Um, I, I can see it from my own expertise, like um, we have like the playgrounds that are in different parts in the city, but I think it's also very important to go back to the streets and the neighborhoods, the 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 public space is really close to uh, near the house, not only for the children but also for the women and men, um, because it's sometimes very difficult to go to a certain space and to say, okay, I feel comfortable and welcome here. But if you focus more on the streets or in the living areas uh, and bring this back to a, a place where you can live and be yourself, then it's much easier to to claim together or be together in this space if you're a, ch a, a girl a boy a woman or a man to really bring bring the neighborhood together again so yeah okay, maybe it's time to have a look to the to the my right side <laughs> because there someone is uh, keeping an eye on the chat and maybe we have some questions from the audience yes indeed we have um we have Lynn uh, describing herself as a very happy or uh, satisfied uh, social housing tenant herself and um, she visited social housing project in Vienna and was surprised by the amount uh, of both collective spaces, shared spaces and uh, community services such as uh, babysitting services, um, paid, non-paid uh, services. Uh, her question is uh, are these collective spaces, community services on the scale of a housing, a social housing project, um, or might they be a solution for more uh, women-oriented uh, cities? I think else that could be something for you as a also a housing expert, <laughs> I might say. Yeah. I I, uh, I have to think to Berlin. Do you have also a lot of green areas there, and also houses that is uh, um, related to courtyards and so? And it's a very child-friendly city. Also, the public transport you can do everything with trolleys and so on. Um, so a green city, and then with the courtyards and the, the services. I think it's it, it it would be indeed a solution. The question: If in our dense cities, is there enough place to realize that? Uh, maybe on new sites or re, um, reconverted sites. Um, but yeah, I think it's the, the the whole tendency now for co-housing. It's also a way to um, to bring in more cooperative uh, shared green spaces and so on. So I think it's a future. But also then it was already said that in cooperative houses you often have uh, again the white middle class um, people living there. Um, 
yeah, Rutsunen did an interesting research there, and yeah, that was her conclusion. Okay, thank you. I, I hope this answers uh, Lane's question. Um, maybe Giselle's question um, is also quite relevant. Uh, so we're talking about mothers a lot of the time. So does this also uh, in relate to, to women that are not mothers? That's, that's her and question. We can pass that question to Leslie. Yes, thank you. You're, you're right. A lot of the conversation does tend to focus on sort of women as caregivers and, and mothers would be a primary way that that role plays out in many women's lives. But um, more widely speaking, um, uh, my interest, yeah, in feminicity is, is not just about mothers, but about expanding our notions of kind of our kinship relationships beyond the sort of traditional nuclear family which is assumed to be you know the primary relationship the most important one is the one that you have with an intimate partner and your children and i, I think you know our cities have been in many parts of the world built up to reflect that primacy of that relationship but especially in COVID, again i think we're, we're wondering is it really sustainable to have everything focused on the family, to have the family and the home provide everything that we're supposed to need? Um, I think even just the day-to-day -day irritations of living with your partner and family would suggest no. So how can we imagine um, elevating the importance of other forms of kinship, friendship, intergenerational families, uh, relationships with non-human nature, our, our companion animals and, and other forms of, of beings in the world, um, other ways of shaping our households that would be perhaps more environmentally sustainable, more would collectivize care work and, and be more sharing. So in that sense, that, that includes a much wider group than people who are, who are parents, but recognizes that we all have a need for something called family, but it might not look like the family that we've been told is, is the norm. Yes, yes, and indeed, uh, I can also say that uh, as a mother, I'm, I'm missing a little bit the city of uh, France and also <laughs> the city for myself, <laughs> or for my own, um, in this COVID pandemic. And I think that uh, is the case for a lot of mothers, actually. Um, uh, I'm looking to uh, the other presenter. Sabine, do you want to add something to the yeah, discussion? I'm not a mother or, or <laughs> only a plus mother, we say, but uh, I live together with, uh, with um, in, in a co-housing with roommates uh, in, uh, in, uh, in, the, in the center of the north uh, part of, uh, of Brussels. And, and in the COVID times, it was so, so, so important to meet with friends outside uh, and to be, be together. Um, so, and uh, there we really, you know, we also found each other ag uh, again in this way that we we walked and we biked and normally we go on, ca on a cafe yeah, and this is really like a, a Dansart Fleming uh, <laughs> way of living or like a hipster uh, way of living uh, to go uh, meet in coffee bars and cafes and now we have to find different ways to meet and uh, Corona really opened up uh, the 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 public space for me and my friends because I really like to walk and to bike already but now I could take my friends without uh, you know questioning why we are going to walk you know so uh, it was very nice yeah mm -hmm. well I think that it's almost nine o'clock and maybe I think we can close here and and maybe it's also important to say that it felt s somehow really amazing to come to this place and in a real setting with an invisible audience but I still think that you are there and I hope that you are there and that you enjoyed it and I want to thank all the speakers uh, Sabine, Els, Alessandra and of course Leslie for your invitation uh, of doing and making the city differently and, and ultimately to come to a more equal and just city I think and of course um, so thank you all of you thank you also to the public and also thank Thank you to uh, Stadsform, um, its curator Jan de Noe and uh, Stijn Oosterlink for the f from the Urban Studies Institute um, for setting this uh, up. I would also personally like to thank Valerie de Kane for, for her uh, reflections that we had yesterday uh, night. And I think that Jan, you still would like to share some concluding words or remarks uh, with us, isn't it? So thank you all. Yes, some uh, some some last words. Like I, I hope everyone enjoyed the evening. Um, 
here are some other ones coming up uh, soon. So next uh, week on the 24th of November, we have an after talk of the, um, yeah, of the documentary Push, which is about the financialization of housing, uh, which you can now watch online uh, if you subscribe for the event, which you can find on, on our website or, or on Facebook. So you can watch a documentary for free. And then on the 24th at 8 o'clock, we'll discuss it with... Um, with uh, lots of uh, interesting speakers. Um, on the 25th, uh, on, on Wednesday, uh, we have a, a Dutch event, uh, Boek Lancering uh, Zwerfruimte Wonder Space, uh, van het uh, architectuur collectief REST, uh, met onder andere uh, de oud Vla Vlaamse bouwmeester Leo van Broek, uh, maar ook vele andere sprekers, zoals Tine Hens, uh, zullen we het hebben over um, ja, een beetje het, het ruimtelijk dieet dat we zouden moeten uh, creëren, um, door niet meer te veel te bouwen, maar te gebruiken wat we al hebben. Um, zo, dan zijn we... Uh, op het einde van de avond een paar laatste woorden door de fantastische moderator Loes. Some last words by the fantastic moderator Loes. I thought I already closed. Th 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 gave my final words, but th th so I, I would like to say again, thank you for being here, uh, for thinking uh, with us uh, about what the feminist city could be and how it it could open up some more space for some more people and how we could move from the city of men to the city for everyone. Thank you so much. Have a good night. Thank you. Good night. Thank you, everyone.